While there's no single method for increasing throwing velocity, no one can argue with the fact that while great pitchers come in many different sizes, strength and athleticism rank among one of the top factors in creating a high velocity throw. So in this webinar, we're going to touch briefly on 10 different topics on how to increase pitching velocity in the weight room. These will include increasing lower body strength, increasing power output, gains in lean muscle mass, increasing lead leg IR, improving anterior and rotary core control, improving posterior cuff strength, improving soft tissue quality, creating dynamic stability, improving core stability and transfer of power from the lower half to the upper half, and taking a break from throwing and working on some active recovery. In the pitching world, the word velocity has become how most pitchers are initially judged. Every pitcher is built differently and trying to get there from a different starting point, such as their current velo, how much time we have before competition starts, and what may be their lowest hanging fruit. So, unfortunately, this leaves no single way to map out a game plan to help increase velocity, and no single thing I could tell you to do to increase velocity. What may work for one pitcher may not work for another. After a long throwing season, more throwing in the fall may or not be in a player's best interest. A lot of times we recommend um, that maybe fall ball is not the best option or tournaments are not the best option for A, a kid who already has a college commit or is just throwing at such a low velo that he's actually showcasing himself off the list. This time may be better used to steer their focus towards adding more lean muscle mass and getting more athletic. A pitcher will be much more aware of using his lower body if he becomes more aware that he even has one. In addition, the posterior chain, hamstrings and glutes, are among the most and biggest powerful muscles in the body, contributing up to 85% of fastball velo. The trap bar deadlift is great for training full body strength and teaching force application into the ground. And like I said before, the lower half is the prime mover for creating a more powerful and explosive throw. In an explosive sport like baseball, how quickly you apply your strength, in other words power, is king. The equation for power is force times velocity. So, once we increase force production by training strength, we must now learn to apply our newfound strength quickly. We love utilizing trap bar deadlifts and weighted jumps with the trap bar deadlifts that you see here um, at about 50 to 60% of an athlete's one rep max. This helps get our pitchers to produce force more rapidly, thus increasing their power on the mound and field. And with the addition of the new Proteus motion that you can see here on your left, we can train rotary power in the upper body more effectively as well. On a side note, strength training in the weight room will also help to release testosterone, a major player in gaining lean muscle mass, which brings us to our next topic. Statistics have shown that there is a clear relationship between lean body mass and velocity. More good weight, in other words muscle, gives a pitcher the ability to produce more force when moving down the mound, having a positive impact on velocity. The downside to this, however, is that the lead leg has to absorb that extra force upon landing. If the body weight gained is lean muscle, the leg will be stronger and better able to stabilize with no problem. However, a body that gained body fat with little lean muscle mass and is still trying to support the extra force at landing will be much more likely to get injured. So, the take home here is make sure your weight gain is muscle, not body fat. And this can be accomplished through a clean diet. Gaining lean muscle mass will give you the strength to deal with all the new force your body is creating. Many control issues, however, happen when a pitcher gets too big too fast. If the weight gain is done gradually, then it would be more natural feeling to the athlete. And once his pitching coach teaches him to settle into his new, more powerful machine, he can begin to use the extra power to his advantage. If you want to know where you stand in regards to muscle mass, Here's a great reference for average weight ranges among young, high-level pitchers based on height. I'd like to thank Graham Lehman for this chart. Ideally, we want both body weight and body fat to be within a certain range. 
Most of today's minor league and professional pitchers, on average, have anywhere between 10 to 15% body fat. If you're not within 10 to 20 pounds of the minimum end of the above range and at 10 to 15% body fat, you need to get in the gym and also take part in a nutrition plan to help you put on weight. After a long season, the hip can get rather gritty due to losses in IR, which can be attributed to the forces applied to it during throwing, mostly at foot strike and release, causing problems further up the chain, such as deceleration problems, upper body compensations, anterior shoulder pain, posterior elbow pain, and it can also drastically affect opposite arm IR, since the lower body cannot adequately help decelerate, causing the upper body to overcompensate and create a bang on the anterior shoulder. The single leg deadlift, or SLDL, is a great one to not only get more IR in the hips, but strengthen the posterior chain, and this will really help decelerate the leg as well at the same time. As for the bowler squat seen here on the right, this is a staple warm-up for many of our guys who present with less than optimal hip IR during their assessment. We need to get to neutral before we can successfully train strength and or power, and developing the anterior core can go a long way in getting us there by helping with resisting extension and rotation. Because of their attachment on the rib cage, the external obliques are great for getting posterior tilt of the pelvis without getting the ribs down. So, control of extension is not separate from control of rotation at the spine. As for better transfer from the lower to upper body, one of the main functions of the anterior core is to this transfer of force between the lower and upper body. Therefore, the anterior core control rotational core tandem has been shown to be positively related to power production. Reducing the risk of low back injury by controlling extension, especially in layback. Um, Resisting spinal range of motion and attaining stability are positively related to lower back injury reduction. Back specialist Stuart McGill once said, um, the more your spine moves to create force as opposed to simply transferring it, the more likely you are to get hurt. I love that statement. And also improved shoulder function. The lats have tremendous implications for athletic performance and aesthetics. On the other hand, if they're on all the time, as we often see in extension-based postures, you can't get to important positions with, with the right movement quality, and it can cause limited shoulder flexion, limited upward rotation, elbow valgus, valgus torque, um, getting into max ER and layback. Here's an exercise that not only helps strengthen the anterior core, but does it in a more sports specific position, seen here being foot plant. Be sure to keep the rib cage down, keep that back glute activated throughout to help pelvic stability, and keep the body weight and tension in that front leg to help simulate foot strike. As mentioned earlier, Velocity requires both arm strength and arm speed, and there is a difference between the two. While cuff strength and scapular stability can be increased in the weight room, many athletes are under the assumption that throwing, particularly with weighted balls, will build arm strength. Let's first clarify that throwing helps build arm speed, not strength. That should be left to the weight room. Strengthening the posterior cuff will also help with decelerating the arm during throwing. We're big proponents of using the throwing sock, seen here on the left. And, in turn, this helps shut down the bicep and allow the pronators to do their thing. And finally, by promoting better pronation, it cuts down on that bang that can occur from lack of pronation at finish. Long seasons combined with short off seasons can lead to scar tissue and knots that form on the fascia of the muscle. These can contribute to faulty movement patterns, losses in velo, and sometimes pain or injury. If you can't move correctly, you can't optimize the necessary mechanics to throw at high velocities. Another benefit to soft tissue work is that it delivers the benefits of stretching to pitchers with loose joints. Laxity is prevalent in many pitchers, whether it be from genetics or throwing, so they generally shouldn't be stretching through their passive restraints to begin with. Soft tissue work is a great way around this problem. Implementing foam rollers, lacrosse balls, and tiger tails before workouts and games is a great and inexpensive way to warm up and help maximize performance. Be sure to focus on the big players such as the pec minor, the lats, 
T-spine, and triceps, to name a few. And here are a couple good examples. The shoulder moves in three planes of motion, sagittal front to back, frontal side to side, and transverse, rotationally. So while it's moving in one direction, the cuff musculature is firing to help stabilize in the other two. We need to create strength, timing, and stability in the shoulder, but we must make sure we can do it while the arm is in motion. Doing this stabilization in a 90-90 position helps focus more on the cuff, while the use of a band to simulate glove side is great as well. In addition, more injuries are caused from poor firing time of the cuff than actual weakness of the cuff. This exercise works on the required strength, timing of the scapula on the rib cage, and timing of the humerus, the arm, on the scapula. Much of a pitcher's power comes from the lower body. If the core is not strong enough to help transfer this power into the upper body and through to the arm, it will cause energy leaks and have a negative effect on the pitcher's ability to throw gas. The dynamic cable lift is great for training this transfer in the weight room. Here's another exercise inspired by Franz Bosch's dynamic systems. The use of a 10 to 20 pound Viper, as you can see this athlete holding overhead, um, makes us a very much more challenging than it actually looks um, and great for transfer of force as well. As if throwing a baseball from March through June isn't enough, add in summer league, tournaments, showcases, fall ball, and off-season training, and it easily makes baseball a year-round sport. Most arms and hips aren't designed to tolerate those explosive forces for that long, which is why many start complaining about anterior shoulder pain, medial elbow pain, and low back pain around August to September. By sometime late in the season, the body is simply broken down. Taking some time off from throwing in November and December and participating in active recovery instead can be helpful in a variety of ways. Here's an example of an active recovery day that is given to our throwers as a deload. This day is designed to promote recovery. It's used in between all other throwing days in the program because of the fact that it has the lowest volume. And there's two types of recovery days, a no throw recovery day and a connection one where we're actually doing some light mechanical remapping with some drills. The quest for velocity can also come at a price. Some pitchers are in velocity programs claiming they can get you that extra three to five miles per hour without even knowing if the pitcher has built up a stable enough base of support through strength training to be able to even handle that increase. You may get that three to five miles per hour, but chances are you won't keep it, keep it there or end up getting injured. Also, improving velocity is a process with many different attributes that go into it. Pitcher workouts fo focusing on the lower half to increase velocity should be top of mind for every pitcher. My simple advice is get strong and mobile first. The rest will fall into place and velocity will come. And also remember, heavy is not always better, the only, and it's not the only way to velo. We have to consider lifting lighter weights faster at some point and help increase power and acceleration. Let's not forget about increasing lean body mass. We want to lose body fat, we want to gain muscle, and that comes to eating enough calories, lifting, and eating a clean diet. And lastly, there are a lot of folks who pitch the idea of how to increase pitching velocity by even 10 miles per hour. Be aware of programs that boast of quick or large leaps in velo. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning into this webinar today. Uh, you can reach us at Baseball Training and Development, 40 Eisenhower Drive, Paramus, New Jersey. There's our digits. You can also go onto our website. There's a lot of articles on throwing and lifting. Um, www.rocklandpeakperformance.com. There's our Twitter handle. There's our Instagram handle. And uh, see you next time around.